What's up, guys, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Neo Vintage Podcast. I am Jabril, and I am with... Steve, hope everyone's doing well. And for you guys who don't know, we're just two guys that like to talk over the biggest stories in gaming, and we got a really interesting show for you guys this week. So there wasn't a whole bunch of stories, but the nature of the stories that we're covering this week are really, really big. So yeah. you guys are going to get a lot out of us this week, and plus we have two loose topics for you guys that are really, really interesting and are going to be really fun to cover. Mm-hmm. So, Steve, are you ready for this first topic? Nintendo. Big. Nintendo's Mario 35th Anniversary Direct. Alright, so the way we're going to do this is there was a whole bunch of announcements and each one is really interesting. And before we get into it, I just want to say, no, we're not going to be talking about the outfits and the little knickknacks that they announced that they're going to the be releasing and Mario stickers. <laughs> we're not, yeah, we're not doing that. But uh, the first one, they're celebrating the 35th anniversary of Super Mario Bros. And for this anniversary, they announced a ton of new awesome things coming up. First one is Super Mario 3D World and Bowser's Fury. So this is a deluxe re-release of the popular Wii U game. It's set Mm -hmm. for release on February 12th, 2021. Steve, are you excited about this? Now, I'm I'm excited because it's been a long time since I played this. I did play this on, I'm one of those few people who had Wii U. I did play this on Wii U, and it is a good game. So um, it's just also kind of long. Um, I don't know if hopefully you can maybe jump into Bowser's Fury and some of this extra stuff without it. I do see they did some, like, you know, cleaning up on, you know, obviously they rendered so it looks a little bit nicer. And they apparently they sped it up, which is always, it's weird. I thought that was a complaint only I had where they're like, sometimes Cat Mario or if you had a certain power, they just wouldn't run as fast as I wanted them to, which would make jumps. And obviously Mario being platform, making the platforming difficult so they like oh yeah we sort of tweak this and stuff like that so i'm excited i don't know what i'm going to be doing february 2021 i, I always kind of i think that's like far cry 6 territory yeah around so there. i i don't know you know you know we'll have the new systems in hand uh assumingly maybe this will be if i'm clear on switch like not really doing anything else i'll probably pick this up but it's been a while since i played again i did like one playthrough and then to unlock like rosalina was like super hard you had to get like every single collectible i was like ridiculous not gonna do it um maybe having it on the go would just be a little bit nicer but i'm excited for it and uh, again i'll pick it up it very late i thought it would probably be sneaking out this year i'll get to keep mario in the talks but uh you know they're 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 there at least and we all knew this was coming for a long time uh, at least you know because everything from wii u is being made to a deluxe version or you know a plus version so more Mario isn't necessarily bad. I would have preferred a new Mario, but it is a good game. Yeah, um, it, it it's one of those things that I'm not, like, the biggest fan of, like, the $60 re-release Nintendo strategy. Yes. Mm-hmm. When the, the console first launched, I have to admit, I bought a couple of those, especially some of the Wii U ports. I have a lot of those. But later into the generation, as the years have progressed, they've kind of re-released everything. And some things I'm cool, more cool with than others. That Obviously, the Tropical Freeze treatment is probably the ideal situation. But every once in a while, you know, we get one and it's like, all right, yeah, yeah, we get it. You're re-releasing everything. And so I'm not like the the most excited about that. But they lucked out with this one because this is one of the few Wii games that I barely touched. The, every time I played it was at your house. So yep. I, I don't have much experience with this. I do have this game physically because I bought it with my Wii U. But, you know, I didn't have my Wii U for very long before the Switch was out. That's true. Less than a year. So And I played mostly Mario Kart on it. So this is a game that I haven't really experienced at all. I and I've seen a lot of screenshot of like the different levels and there's some really interesting stuff that they do in this game that it's probably enough for me to to pick it up. Ultimately, yeah, you you brought up a great point. In February, I need to see where I'm at. I'm coming off a lot of games at that point. Sometimes I can do the balance of like a major console game like a Far Cry and the Nintendo game and I'm usually able to balance it like Ghost of Tsushima and Paper Mario that can happen. Mm-hmm. So if nothing else is out at that time, it could definitely I could see it fitting in there, and I don't think there's anything major on Switch gonna that is announced that's coming out at that time. So I might be able to balance it, and uh, I'm just curious to see what Bowser's Fury turns out to be, like how substantive of a DLC add-on or whatever it's gonna be. Is it an expansion? I, I'm not exactly sure. I don't know if it's a new mode. It's obviously something new that they're tacking on there, yeah. and I don't know if it's like you could play the game as Bowser or something like that. So I'm curious to see how much that is, and that could shape a lot of the value proposition. And maybe if it's if it's a lot of new campaign and new character and a whole new expansion, yeah, then maybe I think it's it's well worth the uh, sixty dollars. 
Yeah, and, and hopefully that's something we, I'm sure we'll see later on in, a, I guess, a more formal direct. Because they didn't really show anything. They showed what looked like a stage. And playing as Bowser would be cool. You know, that was one of my favorite parts in Odyssey was playing that small section of Bowser. So it's like, they've already played with that aspect, so why not give it to us? Yeah, so the next one is one that I did not see coming at all. And during the new segment, I, I kind of brought it up by saying, like, I have to give Nintendo credit. There's a lot of things that I get really annoyed about this company at, and we'll get into them later on. But one thing that you can never hold against them is their creativity and the way that they are able to take a conventional idea and like spin it on its head in such a creative, insane way. So Super Mario Bros. 35, which is basically a battle royale game, but closer to a Tetris 99 than mm -hmm. a Fortnite. Did this interest you at all? So I was I had mixed feelings about this because I'm not sure if you're aware there was an online game that did this already. Oh, really? Okay. And Nintendo came and came out with the legal books and shut it down. I don't remember if it was 35 specific. I think it may have been like 100. Um, but everything else looked exactly like this, where oh, it was 100 Marios or something <laughs> like that. And they came and legally shut it down. You know them. You know you know them. So when I saw this, I laughed because I was like, hold on, hold on. Did, I mean, I'm sure this may be sort of in the works early since Tetris 99. I just thought it was very... How convenient that something that people online were loving and now you're temporarily attaching it to our nintendo service i think it's still going to be good again the legally all that stuff out of the way i think it's interesting that that is a creative way to do um a mario battle royale pretty much i probably won't be very good at this because you know people people in that first mario brothers man brutal Oof. You know, and then with, you know, the random enemies popping, if, the, you know, one person kills it. I'm not that great at, te I'm good at Tetris. Tetris 99, no, nowhere near. So I'm excited for this. Again, this is attached to the Switch Online service, correct? Yes, yeah, So sure. yeah, so It's going to be similar to Tetris 99. Yeah, so I'll, so I'll check it out for sure. Play it probably one day, and unless somehow I'm magically good at it, um, that'll probably be my end with it. But I'm excited that they're at least, one, beefing up the... Nintendo online service a little bit even though because I think this is only a limited time thing which we have to get into that later but yeah that weird March cutoff that weird March cutoff for multiple items so it's it's pretty cool though I think that is a cool thing I think that's something the fans are going to love because most people just pay 20 bucks a year have their Nintendo services and it's very akin to releasing like uh Fall Guys on you know PlayStation Plus where everyone's going to be there yeah. And now this is the same. Releasing this, everyone who has a Switch is probably have online already. They're going to be there testing out because it's free to them. Yeah, the way that they kind of formatted this version, whether, again, it was by Nintendo's creation or those, I guess, indie devs that got ripped. It, first time I'm hearing of that story, I'm definitely going to look into that. I stand corrected on that. But um, it, it's a very creative way to go about it because if you would have just come to me and be like, okay, make Mario Brothers but Battle Royale, the way I would have done it, is I would have imagined, imagine kind of like a side-scrolling version of it where you're running from left to right and there's a whole bunch of ghost characters, like when you're doing a time trial, for example, mm -hmm. of all the other players. And they do like kind of like a Fall Guys-esque thing where they give you a randomized level and see who makes it to the end and make it crazy hard. That's how I would have expected it to take a form of, but this kind of like combative where you have to simultaneously platform and be offensive is pretty genius but uh i i can't imagine me being able to survive at all in this game i mean i i'm good at tetris and i couldn't do tetris 99 i'm terrible at mario so i can yeah. only imagine it's it's done yeah no it's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be weird but uh it, i think it'll be fun at first like it'll be comical and then quickly be like all right i'm done with this so the next announcement was one of the more weird ones, but it really tapped deeply into my soul and then subsequently made me cry, which is Game & Watch, the Super Mario Bros. edition. It's launching on November 13th for $50. Now, it's important to mention this one also has that March cutoff of availability. They also mm -hmm. said that it's a limited release. So that lets you know for you guys who are not that experienced that if Nintendo is saying it's limited, congratulations, you're not getting it. The scalpers are. Yep. You are not getting your hands for this for $50 unless you super luck out. Unless you live in Indiana and they got nobody buying anything at the GameStop. <laughs> but uh, 
does this interest you at all? I've always wanted a Game & Watch, and you know I'm really into the collector stuff, and I know you are too. Does this interest you? Yeah, as a collector, when I saw this, oh man, I could not stop agreeing. Because, again, this whole Direct was Shadow Drop, so when you sent me this link... I was like, yeah, I gotta go uh, use the restroom. I'm at work, so I was like, I gotta <laughs> wink, wink, use the restroom. <laughs> and I was in there just watching the whole thing. And when I saw this, oh, my heart was just like, oh, I need this. Then you see the nice little box. And as before they even said it's a limited production, I'm like, I was like, damn, I'm not gonna, I won't be able to find this, will I? I was like, I don't think I'll be able to find this. And then they come out, and it's gonna be limited release. I said, oh my goodness. Yeah, you don't stand a chance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really excited, and I like the pre, the fact that there's like three pre-installed games. It's just such a weird device. It's such a collector's item. You could tell that they didn't intend this for like just mainstream release for the everyday gamer. No, for sure. And you know what's sad about this is that most people are gonna buy it and then leave it on their shelf unopened to yeah. not even be able to experience it the way it needs to be. And again, I'm gonna end up probably gonna probably buy it from a scalper, but to a limited. I'm not paying scalping prices for it. it depends so if i can find it reason if i can find it directly from them perfect i'm not paying loads of money for this i, I, yeah. from, I got to at most 75 for you guys like yeah. i'm not i'm not spending a brick on this because at, again yeah at the end of the day i'm gonna play this but this is not something i'm gonna get like 120 hours out of yeah, and no, on sure. top of that i hate the resale market it's really annoying and, and resale long term is fine. Yeah, when things get out of production and some people sell on eBay, yeah, for a markup because it's not being produced anymore, that's one thing. But mm -hmm. when these people just like grab up everything at launch, it drives me nuts because again, nobody benefits from that. Okay, you get uh, you get a little bit of money out of it and every once in a while, I get excited when like the scalpers buy all these devices and the devices flop, so now so someone out there has like 170 PlayStation Classics. Yeah, get wrecked. <laughs> 20 Ouyas. Yikes. Not, you can actually get some money for some Ouyas these mm -hmm. days. Because there's weirdos like me that I'm like, I kind of want one. I kind of do. <laughs> but I refuse to spend more than like 40 bucks on it. That makes sense. All right. The next one is a pretty... If you've been paying attention to the general direction that Nintendo has been going in, this one makes all the sense in the world, which is Mario Kart Live Home Circuit. So for you guys who don't know what this is, this is basically you're racing physical carts, actual toy RC type carts. Uh, with custom courses that you can build around your house. It's out October 16th for about $100. It's definitely in line with the Lego collab type situation, the yeah. NES set uh, physical component of Mario toys that have been coming out lately. It does have a multiplayer component, and it has kind of a camera on the, the cart itself to have some kind of Switch integration. Is this something that interests you at all? I, haven't, I don't know how much you're interested in kind of like the, the toy market. So I saw this and I was like, okay, I, I guess I'd be more excited for this if it was followed up with a Mario Kart 9 announcement. The fact that we got this instead of Mario Kart 9, really I just was like, I couldn't roll my eyes any further back in my head. <laughs> this is fine. I know this is obviously not directed toward me. This is directed toward the, you know, the Labo people, the people who love the Lego sets and all that kind of stuff. That's great for them. I, I don't have an apartment where I can, my apartment's uh, <laughs> laid out very specifically. I cannot rearrange this so I can drive around a piece of plastic toy. I just, I don't have, it's a cool idea, don't get me wrong. I, I, I see for people who have like big living rooms and stuff like that to be able to set up a nice cool little Mario Kart circuit. That's great. It's not for me. I, I'm not going to pre-order this. I'm not interested in this at all. But again, it's not towards me. I think it's super cool though. That Nintendo's really starting to open up now with like different items, and this is something we talked about a while where Nintendo needs to open up and kind of expand a little bit, and they're slowly starting to do it. Now they're really focusing on the toy market, which I mean Nintendo started off as a toy company, so it's nice to see a reunion full circle. And it's real. Let me tell you, this is creative. I did not yeah. see this coming. I thought at first that I'm like, is this just like AR Mario Kart? And it's like, no, you get these little, you know actual movable go-karts you charge them up and all this stuff i'm like that's cool that i mean you go back a couple of years and i'm losing my mind over this um i just don't have the time or space for that anymore but really excited to see what people do with it 
yeah, and the build looks really solid, and I do commend Nintendo on there when mm. they they have they put their names on something. There's definitely that quote unquote seal of quality that they have. Uh, like for example, when they're selling Labo, obviously yes, it's cardboard. But then when you look at like the piano setup and the way it's built, there is like tech integration to it that seems fairly high quality. And if the trailer matches up to reality at all, that camera look on the the cart itself, that physical cart, was actually pretty high quality, and it looked like. It was running pretty decent, too. So, again, ultimately, your mileage may vary in terms of how it's actually going to turn out. But from what they're showing off, if they're actually able to pull it off, it's going to be really, really imp- impressive. And, uh, yeah, for me, this is definitely not something I'm going to get because, and you know this about me, toys are kind of my hard cutoff where yeah. I am collector addict brain man where I can, I just collect. That's my thing. That's my one vice. And I have to have hard cutoffs of things that I cannot do. And toys is one mm-hmm. of those because I know I'll go crazy. <laughs> I know yeah. because suddenly, yeah, then I'm on eBay buying moon shoes. I, I will get out of control. <laughs> so, so I have a hard cut off, no toys. So I can't do this. If mm. I had like a family situation and I had like toddlers running around and they were looking for something to play, maybe we could talk about this a little bit differently because then that means that something that could please them and interest me. That's a whole different situation for me by myself, me and my girlfriend and our cats. Eh, I'm definitely not racing carts with those guys around they're gonna kill them <laughs> yeah that's absolutely true yeah no cats and uh, it's yeah. not happening uh the next one's pretty quick one i something that i thought about and i was like wait this doesn't exist but then i was like oh no that's true uh the original super mario all-stars pack uh from the super nintendo days is actually yep. going to be available to play on the nintendo switch online service uh for you guys who don't know what this is this is basically a super nintendo collection that they dropped in the 90s of remade versions of the first three games and the lost level so basically take mario bros one two and three mm-hmm. with uh the nice basically mario world graphics 16-bit graphics beautiful version plays amazingly they tweak some things here and there uh and then i believe this this also gets packaged in with the lost levels too right correct and lost levels for you guys that don't know are is the original mario 2 The Mario 2 we got in America was a reskin of a game called Doki Doki Panic. It's a whole thing. Everybody knows about it. So Lost Levels is like the hard version of Mario 2, and we're getting all that on the Switch Online service. So I'll probably play that uh, a little bit. But again, guys like us, we've played this collection to death at this point, so... Yeah, so it was cool. I'm like, I was in the same boat. I'm like, this this isn't on the Switch... Uh, classic. I swore I thought it was. And then I'm like, oh, the individual games are, and then I... You know, then luckily it was available that later that afternoon, so I updated my Switch Online, and I played through the first Mario, and I was like, because it's been a long time since I've played the All-Stars version. I've played, obviously, the original Mario multiple times throughout the year, and I, wow, I, forgot, I was like, wow, I forgot how good this looks. This is, like, at the time, a ground-up remake. The game looks... Yeah, it's impressive what they did like Super this. impressive, and I'm like, whoa, I completely forgot about it. Uh, I skipped over two because I'm not a huge fan of Mario 2. I did jump right into the Lost Levels, which I know is original Mario 2, whatever. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so I jumped into those, and again, I was super excited to play through them again. I'll probably play through them once, and then it'll be nice knowing that it's there, I didn't see if this had a time limit. I don't think it did, which is, again, starting to get annoying with that. But it's nice to have on there. It's nice for people to be able to play, like, the original Mario trilogy plus another game that, you know, over here we always... I just think Lost Levels gets a lot of missing. Like, people forget about it a lot. They go Mario 1, 2, and 3. They forget about the Lost Levels, which is really good and, you know, difficult. It is difficult. But it's great to finally have this package on the go, nice and easy, not having to hook up like, you know, a Retron or a portable Game Boy or any of those things to play it. Yeah, and I would say Lost Levels is traditionally difficult, but now that Mario Maker is a thing and you'll see what some of these people are doing, (laughs) it really contextualizes kind of like the sliding scale of difficulty as time progresses, where... Some th- some things get harder as time progresses. Like, I feel like in many ways, some of the classic Castlevanias are probably considered tougher now than they were back then. But yeah. then, now that, like, Mario Maker exists, I feel like Lost Level's a lot more tame than what, what some people are beating nowadays. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah and All-Stars is a classic. Uh, the only thing, the only one I don't really play that much is the All-Stars version of 3. 
just because I really do like the look of the original three more mm-hmm. than the All Stars version. That's the one that I'm like I prefer the original actually. That kind of play look to it with yeah. the shadow backdrop. I just feel like that that the crispy. 8-bit edges looks a little better than the 16-bit softer version because again three all-stars looks a lot like world and i felt like that sharp difference between the original three and mario world is what differentiated them and made them both so awesome so when you get the all-stars version it makes it too close i start getting triggered i don't like it yes that that is true that is true there's uh, something about three that has that aspect that way in, in that style and you lose a little bit of that uniqueness and that um, identity with it. Yeah, for sure. And then, okay, so f- finally we jump into the big one. The one that we've all been waiting for. The one we've all been hoped for. And there's a mm-hmm. lot to unpack here. They announced Super Mario 3D All-Stars. This is going to be coming out September 18th for $60. It contains Mario 64, Super Mario Sunshine, and Super Mario Galaxy. It includes enhancements, uh, like fixing the aspect ratio and stuff like that. Uh, sharpens it up a little bit and has yep. some new features as yep. well. So I don't have to ask you if you're interested in this, but I do want to <laughs> get your general thoughts about this. You know, this has been rumored for a while. We've been leaking and people have been talking about it. And we, I think, twice discussed it on here. Yeah. And my goodness, it's real. It's real. I'm so excited. Yes. Uh, initially, I'm super excited that it's real. Mario 64 has just such a place in my heart, in my gaming history, and I love Galaxy. I always hate having to hook up a Wii to play it. Sunshine I do enjoy. I'm a little less, like, that's my least one I'll probably play on here, just because okay. I do like Sunshine. I love music. I love the, the music, the style, and everything like that. I just don't want to spray water everywhere. Yeah. But uh, I'm super excited. I'm glad that they even went through and, like, you know, I saw some side-by-side comparisons, like, you know, like, 64 is not a ground-up remake. Obviously, it's a port, but they did clean up the HUD. They made some textures a little bit sharper, and Mario looks a little bit cleaner. The colors are a little bit better. And the same for Sunshine and Galaxy. Obviously, Galaxy looks the best, but I have to give it to Sunshine. When they showed Sunshine, and I watched a video that did a side-by-side, Sunshine good, Sunshine looks like a Switch game. Like, oh my goodness, the art style, the, it is clean. My goodness, Sunshine looks great. So I'm super happy to get it. I don't understand why this was so late released. It comes out September 18th. That's in like two weeks. <laughs> yeah. So what what's going on with that? And on top of that, they're doing the limited time release. But before we jo- go into that, yeah. I mean, I, I know I'm pre-ordering it. And I think you have it pre-ordered twice, don't you? Well, okay, so I pre-ordered it digitally, um, okay. but upon really unpacking the whole March cutoff situation, which again, we'll get into, because mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot to unpack there, I thought immediately, I'm like, wait, and I'm, I'm going to, heads up to every collector who's listening right now, get, if you're going to get one game physical, get this game physical, I'm telling right. you, especially yeah. if you eventually plan on maybe flipping some of your collection, get this game physical. Because this is going to stop being sold in some capacity. There's arguments whether it's the bundle itself is going to be stopped, or is it if it's going to end, you know, enter the Disney Vault type situation and go away altogether. We don't mm-hmm. know. But this this game is one that you want to get physical because this is going to be a nightmare to get one day. Yeah, when once this is patch March and they stop producing these games, this is going to skyrocket mm-hmm. in price. This has a sixty dollar price tag now. I would not be surprised if by the end of twenty twenty one, this game shoots up to a hundred, hundred twenty dollars easily on resale market. When uh, no, you know, you're not seeing this in stores anymore because again, this is going to sell out everywhere. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm really really excited about this game. Um, it's one of those things where I'm like, how am I going to juggle these three games? Because I honestly love them all for very different reasons. Yeah, yeah. Like, and Galaxy is probably the one I've played the least, so that's one I'm really excited to jump into. Because in in many ways, it's not as bad, but this one kind of skyward sorted is, itself a little bit for me. Where I just hate going back to games with uh, motion controls. I just hate yep. it. Mm-hmm. So this one coming to Switch is awesome. I am aware that they found some way to recreate the... Uh, waggle experience with the joy cons so i know that exists in some capacity what i don't know is if that's the only way to play this game from what i understand there's some kind of touch integration there so hopefully that's very much a thing that i don't have to start wagging my thing around because i like to just play it handheld or doctor one way i don't want to do anything motion so i hope they found a way to not be able to do that 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm curious to see if they have a way to traditionally control it like the other ones. Because yeah, if they found a way to make Galaxy just have joysticks, buttons, that's it, and it plays like Sunshine otherwise, oh yeah, I'm front to back. If it requires some kind of, you know, me waving the Joy-Cons around, it's going to be a little tougher for me to get through. And, uh, yeah, I'm gonna. Have, it's one of those things that I was like, I, I wish I could just play it. Like, I beat 64, then I go to Sunshine, I beat Sunshine, I go to Galaxy. But, like, there's no way I'm waiting to jump into Sunshine and Galaxy. There's no way. So I'm going to have to play them all at the same time, which is going to yeah. be a nightmare. Yeah, these are, all three of them are long games. Um, yeah. Especially if, you know, the point of these games is to be a completionist. Collect the stars, collect the... The sun, you know, the, you know, all the collectibles and stuff like sunshine that, and get all the secret. Time. So, especially Sunshine, yeah, and then getting Galaxy. I don't, can't even remember how big of a game that really is. But I know sixty four. I like to get in there and constantly go back to the same levels to get the different, you know, stars and all the great things. And yeah, I'm, I'm interested on the way Galaxy is gonna work because I think this may show down the line what they may be doing with other uh, Wii games they want to bring over. Because, because I know they showed the pointer thing that works for quote-unquote player two in mario galaxy that can shoot stars and pick up stars yes. and that's fine and all and i know that can work so i guess you can use the touch screen you can drag your finger to collect the star bits yeah. but my big thing is to do the spin attack which is the main attack in this game you used to have to wiggle or whatever i the waggle the little Wii remote so what did, how what how do they replace that and we have more buttons now than ever so i don't see why they couldn't just attach it to a button because if you're telling me i'm sitting on my couch with the pro control because Come on, I'm, I'm not going to sit here waggling my pro control every time I want to do a, a spin attack because that's just not how I want to play this game. Yeah, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did it because, I mean, Let's Go Pikachu did. That's very true. We were stuck with that. Yeah, well, Let's Go Pikachu, you could just push A, though, to toss the Pokeball. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. But, like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm scared that they're going to have me. They did have the thing where you take the whole console and kind of flick it to do it. So I wouldn't. Yeah, no. I wouldn't be surprised if they did some kind of weird flick animation with the whole console or your Joy-Cons or the controller itself with those gyroscopes built in to collect or do the attack. Yeah, Breath of the Wild had it. And that was... A, hmm, that's true, man. I didn't think about Breath I'm praying that they don't. But I, I hope not. be surprised but if they do. They've been... You know, people have asked for clarification. Like, IGN has reached out to them and they haven't clarified specifically, which makes me believe, the, yeah, that the waggle motion control aspect is still in there. They get really weird about control stuff when yeah. you start asking what you're capable of because they always have this kind of suggested experience of what they have in mind for their player base. And yeah, so, Star Fox Zero. Yeah, so they don't like disclosing if there's alternatives. And if there are alternatives, they don't market it. They just let you figure it out on your own. That's kind of how like Splatoon, like they, they're like, can you play without the motion? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah, you can, but they won't come out and just say it because they want you to play a certain way. And it's like, Nintendo, please, I swear, the the moment the Wii sold $120 million or however much it's about, $150 million, I knew it was over. I was like, oh, no. Okay, they're going to be doing this forever. And lo and behold, fast forward to 2020, they're still doing weird things with the controls, which I have zero problem existing. It's the lack of alternatives I take issue with. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm hoping that they have more open dialogue, but one way or another, at least we're not waiting too long. It's going to be two weeks, and then we'll be able to answer all these questions. Uh, so I guess we can jump into the two major controversies regarding this collection. Which yep. the first one is uh, the omission of Galaxy Two, mm-hmm. and then obviously the second one is the availability issues following that March 2021 cutoff. So the first one we can get into is the omission of Galaxy 2. My question to you is, why do you think it's missing? Do you think they want another collection to be released? And if you think that's the case, what else do you think they could tack on to it? So initially I thought to say, I'm like, well, maybe they're saving that for another collection. But there isn't another collection available. Yeah, they only um, have one game to do. Because the only other game you could maybe think they would try packing would be 3D World. So, because they're not going to... Unless they were for some reason to bundle the new Super Mario Brothers, new Super Mario Brothers Wii U. Oh no, that already came. That yeah, already came already to on. Switch. Yeah. Well then, I don't know what they could pack in. I do think it's more tied into my theory on why this is a uh, limited release. That's weird. I, in my brain, I some reason didn't think <laughs> new Super Mario Brothers Wii U. I was thinking they'd put those two Super Mario Brothers and then put Galaxy in. Because, you know, Nintendo loves money. They're like, we can charge another 60 for this. But yeah. they charge $60 just for Wii U Brothers. 
I don't understand. They they they're very quiet. They're very concerning. Galaxy Two should have just been in this, and you could have even charged more. And I know they're re-releases, but you could have charged eighty. And if you had Galaxy Two, people people would be like, "Oh, that's twenty bucks a game. Beautiful." Because you're yeah, basically buy it. twenty. I'd still buy it. I still would be like eighty bucks for these four. Amazing. That's per. That's beautiful. You know, any, anything above that would be a little too much. I don't know if maybe it has something to do with that it's just not ready. Because, how again, because they're being so quiet, how much did they have to change? How much did they have to change Galaxy for it to work without the Wii remotes? Maybe that's taking more time than we think. Obviously, we're not developers, we're not techs. But if they figured it out for Galaxy, a lot of that same stuff carried over to Galaxy 2. Yeah. Because of how close those were. So, I guess it's just not ready, is my initial idea but i think it's going to tie more into that so what did you think about the omission yeah so it, there's a couple of things to unpack there mm-hmm. uh the reason i don't think i think galaxy 2 is probably not in included is probably the fact that they probably wanted to keep that three game format from the original all-stars if i had to guess probably it's probably they just wanted to keep it a clean three games 64 sunshine galaxy galaxy 2 is derivative of the first one it the they probably don't want to get into the sequel game necessarily. It does bump into that issue where they cannot, as you mentioned, they can't do an all, a 3D All-Stars 2 because they would have one game to include in it. Mm-hmm. And you can't tack on New Super Mario Brothers or New Super Mario Brothers U because there is a hard distinction Nintendo's made with Mario games that are 3D and Mario games that are that have 3D graphics. These are different things. So 3D mm-hmm. Mario games are Odyssey. Mario 64. A Mario game with uh, 3D graphics is is a, a 2D game in Nintendo's eyes, which is New Super Mario Brothers, like we got on Wii with the DS version, stuff like that. And yeah. so I doubt that they'd ever, you know, mix the two and bundle uh, Galaxy 2 with New Super Mario Brothers, because in Nintendo's eyes, those are completely different games, completely different series. So that's the kind of the issue there. Uh, I would imagine if these end up on the eShop individually, then then it's probably a matter of time until we get Galaxy 2. Yep. And it, it, it's, it's not one of those... I saw some people trying to speculate, like, maybe they don't consider it a mainline thing. It, I, I doubt that, because it, it doesn't seem like it has that kind of Arkham treatment, where it's, like, done by a different person. No, Galaxy 2 was done by the same team shortly after Galaxy 1. It, it's just as Nintendo as all the rest of them, so... It, I, I can't really think of a logistical reason other than, yeah, it wasn't technically ready or they just wanted to keep it clean three-game sequel just like the original All-Stars pack. I don't but, know, uh, maybe. But oh, yeah, Lost Levels, has, right? But All-Stars has four games. Oh, yeah, Lost Levels. Yeah. So now they're, just, now they're just slacking. But uh, I agree with you that I think... So, obviously, this has... The the, the other controversy is the dates. So And they're very coincided, yeah. in my opinion. This is going to be available... Not only so this is, this is what didn't make sense, and they had to clarify. It seemed like the lim. I thought until March they were gonna sell the physical version. Even in March 2021, the digital version's coming down. Yeah. Which is cool, you know coincidence that that's their. I believe that's the end of the fiscal year for them and stuff like that. So this is obviously gonna bump up numbers because if you don't buy it, then you may not have it. You won't have the collection. I also do believe that. Once the collection is down, physical and digital, they're gonna release these separately. Yeah. Probably for like twenty five bucks a pop. Well, I don't know, but I'm just trying to think. I, I just I'm trying to believe in a world where Nintendo's gonna sell Mario Galaxy for twenty five dollars, and that's it doesn't yeah. make sense. It doesn't make sense in my mind. But let's say they do that, and I think it will lead up to Mario Galaxy 2's release. So you you'll be able to get these games again because I don't think Nintendo's gonna be the ones to be like. Well, if you don't have a Switch yet, too bad, because you know, what, especially Disney in the Vault-a? yeah, and Disney Vault it because it's like, well, because people, there's people I see are super excited for this, and they're like, oh, I still don't have the money to get a Switch, or I don't have the ability to Switch, or I had to sell my Switch for X Y Z reasons, and to be like, well, but if you don't get it, you're screwed. Uh, that I I just don't see Nintendo being that um unconsumer friendly. Because it's just, that's just not the world we live in, you know? We weren't told just to go buy a game and it's like, that's it. If you don't buy it right now, you can never buy that game again. Which is a thing that happens, but not in this day and age. So that's my thing is you're going to get these released separately, which is going to spike sales again. And then hopefully end the re-release with 
Galaxy 2. In my in the best world, that's what I believe in, which yeah. sucks because then I'm going to have the first three physical and I have to get Galaxy 2 digital digital because they're not going to just release it. In my mind, they're not going to release it physical by itself, which is such a weird thing. Yeah, I mean, it's a weird situation. So, yeah, obviously that March cutoff has been interpreted basically in two different ways, which is the first way is, yeah, after once March hits, this is done. It's going to go yeah. into the, the Nintendo vault. And if you have it, beautiful, keep it installed. If you don't, you're done it's no longer going to be sold and then maybe it'll resurface in a couple more years when it comes out of the vault we're praying that's not the the case the way i interpreted it is at the end of march the super mario 3d all-stars collection will not exist mario 64 sunshine and galaxy on switch will as individual entities like any other nintendo game on the eShop. that's how i interpreted it Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, we're going to see... I feel like both moves are strange. I don't know why they're doing it like this. Wh- why having a timed release for a bundle on this magnitude is strange to me. If you're like, okay, Mario thirty five, uh, Mario Brother 35 is going to be kind of a limited thing. We're kind of playing around. It's more like a, an event type situation. Yeah. Fair enough. It's kind of like an online tack on. I'm not, I'm not tripping about that. But the fact that you're having a bundle of three of your biggest games of all time in your number one ip available on your new piece of hardware that people have been asking for since this hardware launched and you finally give them the bundle of it which is a way that we did not expect to ever get it so it's an amazing thing and then you're saying that that's timed i don't get why they why they would format it i don't know what they get out of that limiting its release the only way i could say is Maybe they look at this as kind of like a way to save a little bit of money. Like, hey, we're going to bundle all three together. If you're an early adopter, you get it for this. This is kind of like an early bird special. And then once March hits, you're going to pay, I don't know, $30, $25 each. And you're no longer going to be able to get these three games for $60 as a late adopter. It, just, it'll cost you $75, $80. I just think they should have said that then. Why? Well, you know it's Nintendo. They I know, but <laughs> their their communication is always suffering. Why not tell people? Listen, this collection web will be sold until, and then after that, you have to buy them. They will be available, you know, separately on the eShop. It's so easy to communicate. I don't know. What like, how doing. hard is it to at least have that tagline at the end? Tiles will be available at a later date, separately, whatever it is. And it's gonna be weird because you assume three D All Stars when we put you know whatever the chip in, or if we once we launch it, it's gonna have a menu with the three games. So then you're gonna you had to have someone create it without the menu and so they launch on their own it's just like doing a lot of work for uh, for confusion it makes no sense i mean the way i'm interpreting it is definitely reading between the lines because if we take nintendo at face value as their words as gospel as they're speaking it Mm -hmm. yes as of the end of march this this is all gone according to their words as written yeah at the end of march the digital and physical bundles are gone. They're no longer being produced. If you got it, beautiful. If you don't, you're, you're out of luck. I guess we're just... The reason why we're trying to read into this differently is we cannot imagine a reality where Nintendo giveth and taketh away in this way. We can't We can't imagine that. But again, I wouldn't put anything past them because if it, mm-hmm. uh, we... The, Nintendo has made many decisions that we cannot for the life of us understand why they do yeah. it that way. Why they spent years building a virtual console to just do away with it we i don't know i don't know why they do it it's the same reason why the ps4 doesn't have ps1 games i don't know i i can't i can't explain that there's not one way i can even rationalize why that makes sense why they treat their first party games that they do not have to relicense because they own it Mm -hmm. why they don't just drop it there i don't know but uh and there's no technical limitations why they treat their things this way i couldn't tell you but uh, I, I know all of us as Nintendo fans are hoping and praying that they don't rip these games away indefinitely. But, uh, yeah. well, I mean, we're going to see real soon. Yeah, this is the first time Sunshine and Galaxy get a release. Sunshine is, you know, way older. And you're going to finally re-release it and have it available for six months and that's it? I just don't... I Man, if it's true and these go away forever because of this, you they're going to have a... That's a scary precedent. That's going to be a different story for a different day. We're going to have a nice conversation about that. Yeah, because then they go to Disney territory, which means that, okay, what's going to yep. disappear next? That that exactly. That's concerning. Yep. 
Because I'm like, oh, yeah, if they do that, then it's like, oh, man, the GameCube generation's done. We're yeah. never going to see none of these guys again. We're going to have a different conversation then. We'll see in March. Yeah. But fingers crossed. <laughs> yep. All right. So we can go to the next story. That was a nice chunk on Nintendo. You know, that was a lot to unpack there. Mario yeah. always is big news. And when you put that many Mario together, ridiculous. But uh, I guess a less exciting news, the <laughs> PS5 <laughs> lacks backwards compatibility. So a Ubisoft... The king of leaks over there. I like <laughs> Ubisoft's are king of leaks. I don't care what anyone tells me. A Ubisoft support page explains how its titles will transition from PS4 to PS5 as each publisher seems to be taking a different approach to cross-gen upgrades. Uh, their quote was, backwards compatibility will be available for supported PS4 titles, but will not be possible for PlayStation 3, 2, and PlayStation games. And small update, Ubisoft obviously has taken this down from their support page and as of yet sony has not commented on it and that right there is the biggest cue and answer that we need that the ps5 will not have backwards compatibility to three two and one games i'm surprised on how surprised people were like i was really shocked on how people were like so surprised that like the ps5 won't have backwards compatibility i'm also more excited that it was Obviously, this was trending and people were talking about it. A lot of people didn't care, which is a big no. I know there's people who were bummed and there's people who were out there. But I saw also a lot of people being like, who cares? I want to play PS5 games on my PS5. So I am surprised. Sony not commenting on this brought me right back to when they were not commenting on Horizon being leaked on PC. Yeah. Which everyone took as, well, they have not denied it. As when they, you know, they denied it when... God of War and all these other games were being listed and stuff. They're like, no, we're denying it. Horizon got listed. They said nothing because it came to it. So, obviously, the PS5 we knew was not going to have the backwards compatibility we want. We want PS3, PS2, and PS1 backwards on PS5. We knew we weren't getting this. I'm, just, you know, I don't know why people were still <laughs> having hope. Ubisoft putting it on their page makes it all but official, in my opinion. Unless Sony's really going to come out and come out swinging with a big announcement. I don't know, two months <laughs> before release. I don't know, a day before release for all we know. Uh, were you surprised by this? I- I'm 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 just shocked that it was such a big thing that people were like, "Oh man, it won't have backwards." When we knew, we knew this from the get go. Yeah, it- it's one of those things. It's like disappointed but not surprised. Yeah. Uh, a- again, at the same time, we have to temper our expectations and not be too hasty. Technically, what leaked is not PS5's capabilities, but rather what Ubisoft is willing to support. That's different. So that technically, what we what was leaked was Ubisoft games for the PS3, 2, and 1 will not be available on the PS5. We don't necessarily know that that's going to apply across the board. We also know that this is to be, even if we do interpret this as... Uh, playstation 5 not being able to play 3 2 and 1 games that's at Mm -hmm. least at launch we do we can't say for the entire life cycle of the ps5 that it won't it won't be backwards compatible with those generations at at least at launch it's not going to be supported because again things change because the xbox one with its famed backwards compatibility was also not able to do that at launch so things can change very true yeah very true things can change and they can change fast and they can change uh drastically obviously PlayStation 3, I know a lot of people had, you know, their excitements with that. Anyone who, first off, understands the cell architecture in some capacity and understands Sony's willingness to deal with backwards compatibility knew that was not coming. Obviously, they had a weird relationship with their PS2 games, and PlayStation 1 games is kind of like the no-brainer, we don't know why they're not supporting this. So, yeah, their silence says a lot of things. To me, Sony silence means basically, like... It's not that this is a lie, but we're not ready to talk about this yet. Mm -hmm. Because either one thing, it doesn't look great for us and we're trying to find the media spin on how to approach this. Or we have a marketing rollout for this and we're not going to do that. And that's definitely on the Nintendo type of way where it's like, this is real, but we have a very specific marketing angle to take with this. And that rollout will come when it comes. And until then, we're not saying nothing about that. And that's where the whole we have nothing to announce at this moment thing comes. And so this can come up. You can interpret this multiple ways where it's like either 
Backwards compatibility may be a thing coming at some point. It's just not coming at launch because, again, this launch is going to be a weird one. And I'm sure because of COVID, many things are probably not going to be ready at launch that maybe at one point we're wanting to be there. Mm-hmm. There's going to be games that maybe were launch games that are not going to be there anymore. There's probably hardware things that they wanted to be tacked on that might not be there. Maybe the VR integration may not be there day one or something like that. And maybe backwards compatibility is something they wanted at launch but may not be there. Because, again, emulating is a thing that a lot of people think is just some easy thing to do. But when it's, it's not. Especially when you're talking about backwards compatibility in terms of taking a PS2 disc and popping it into PS5. That's a damn near impossibility. I, I'm telling you, that's not the yeah. way it's going to work. If any, if anything, it's going to work like a key, like Xbox does it, where it's like, yeah, you pop in an old disc and it reads it as a key to unlock something emulating something, but it's not going to natively play these games. So ultimately, uh, we're going to see, if I had to guess, backwards compatibility with PS4 is guaranteed, obviously. Three is probably going to come in the form of PlayStation Now. And yep. maybe they're going to tack on some PlayStation 1 and 2 experiences there. And I think that's probably going to be the way it takes a form. I think PlayStation looks at what affects the bottom line the most. And they're in a real great spot right now. And they ultimately need to put all their resources to the place that gives them the most returns. They're getting the most money right now out of game sales and hardware sales. They're moving a lot of units of games and they're moving a lot of consoles. Microsoft, on the other hand, is making a lot of their money out of services. So naturally, they're going to put a lot more resources into services. PlayStation's making a lot of money out of game sales and hardware sales. So naturally, they're going to put a lot of resources into that, making the most marketable, customer-friendly console. And so naturally, I think that that it makes sense why Sony's not going to put a whole bunch of resources into backwards compatibility when they probably have the metrics and show that when they put a lot of money towards backwards compatibility, Mm -hmm. maybe people didn't pay as much attention to it. And so from their end, it's like, yeah, there's a contingent of people who want backwards compatibility. But let's be honest with ourselves. Is that going to keep you from buying a PS5? No. So ultimately, on Sony's end, does it really matter that much? And I know... It, me, I would use backwards compatibility all the time. But yep, we're in a minority. Man. Let's be yeah. honest. We're in a minority. A lot of people, yeah, are they're going to load up their PS5. And they're not going to immediately jump to play Twisted Metal and Portal. Like, <laughs> that's just a fact. <laughs> yeah. So, ultimately, you can only play towards a minority of people so much before ultimately you need to focus on where the biggest player base is. And the biggest player base on the PS5 and PS4 are PS4 and PS5 gamers, not people who want to play PlayStation 1 games. Yeah, they, yep. they're going to be like, yeah, sorry, you can't play PlayStation, uh, you can't play Parasite Eve on our PS5. Sorry, but you, you can play the new Horizon game. <laughs> like, and, yep. and that's ultimately where their focus is going to be. So it, it's disappointing, but it's not surprising. And I, even though it's disappointing, I can't even necessarily say that it's the worst thing they're doing. Because it makes sense. It's kind of like Call of Duty getting rid of their campaign. Like, does it disappoint me? Yes. Am I surprised? No. Because judging by the general direction the game industry is going in towards, it's not going towards this all-in-one machine thing. And Microsoft being able to, like, double down on that is really awesome. And that's why I love myself some Xbox. Because I really think they're being super customer friendly. But PlayStation's in just in a completely different world right now where they don't need all those extra things. As much as I wish they did, they don't. So, And PlayStation has shown that they're going to do whatever they need to do, but no more, no less, pretty much. Yeah, that's that's a good point, and, and you said it perfectly. I mean, look, the PS4 doesn't have backwards compatibility, and it sold like crazy. Yeah. Look at the go look at the sales figure and you cannot and they've always said that it will not be backwards. We hoped that they'd have uh, figured out something, but here we are, you know, 7 years later, no backwards compatibility and it did not stop it from selling at all. So, I think Sony's looking at that. They're like, "Listen, well, yeah." And let me tell you, if Xbox was winning the way, that, you know, PlayStation was, all that backwards compatibility stuff probably wouldn't be there. That was really different. That was really them being like, oh, we got to scrape something together and get somebody here. And obviously the old collectors, the retro players and stuff like that who want their games played on the new machine, you know, were able to stick by it. But again, I think Sony will have a sort of solution to this. And I think you're very right where PlayStation Now 
will probably be revamped because I know PlayStation now has like some PS3. I know it has PS4 titles, but I know it has some PS3 titles yeah. and you just some, can't download them. You can't download them if they're not a PS4 title. I think they need to revamp the PlayStation now. Forget that name because people just think of bad streaming when they think of that. I don't know, call it PlayStation Archives, whatever you want to do it, and start filling it up. You know, make it a Game Pass for the backwards compatibility. You know, it'd be better if you fold it into PS Plus, but even if you have to make a separate thing for now, Game Pass was a separate thing for a while, just to really get people in there, and then if, I don't know, work, work your way up. They have options, and I'm sure they're looking at it. They're not going to just not do backwards, but we'll have to, you know, see what they end up doing, because... Again, is it a deal breaker? No. You know, it wasn't a deal breaker for my PS4 when I got it on launch. Probably won't be a deal breaker for PS5. But it is nice to have. It is nice to have. Yeah, and, and kind of to close this out, player response means everything. Mm-hmm. And it, could, it, it shapes their direction. I mean, honestly, we have Xbox in this amazing space right now where they're doing all these awesome customer friendly things but to be honest if the xbox one sold astronomically and people love the xbox one then i wouldn't be surprised if we saw a connect integrated halo infinite like that 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 could have been a reality that existed but Mm -hmm. they had to pivot their technique to adapt to the world that existed and try to fish to the modern player base and i think playstation's obviously playing the same game and they saw the returns where it's like we didn't add backwards compatibility and it didn't affect anything if anything it made us sell more the ps4 outsold the ps3 and the ps3 had backwards compatibility in some form yeah so what incentive is there really to do for them to work on all this tech not to mention the more backwards compatibility they offer the more openings and vulnerabilities they expose which means yeah if they have backwards compatibility people are going to start asking why can't you play ps3 natively that's an it, why can the xbox play 360 games and you can't play ps3 games that's mm-hmm. an that's a gap being exposed needlessly also the moment you offer some kind of backwards compatibility naturally people are going to start asking where is this game where is this game well you have to have the pu- certain publishers sign off on certain things not to mention Sony has weird relationships with some people. Microsoft has certain relationship with some people. It, it's a weird game to play. And so naturally, they're, they're not going to expose themselves needlessly and put themselves in a position where things get more complicated than it needs to be. And so ultimately, if you want backwards compatibility, you need to ensure that people are using that one way or another. And unfortunately, that's just not the trend that the industry is going towards. But... uh Ultimately, until Sony says something concretely, you have to take everything with a grain of salt because things change. They can change their mind. Ultimately, we could all be wrong and they could clarify this and be like, no, 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 that's just a Ubisoft thing. Ubisoft's not interested in dealing with their back catalog, but we are going to offer you know, wide range on our platform depending on the platform holder. So maybe Rockstar takes advantage of it and Ubisoft mm-hmm. doesn't. That, yeah. that can be a thing too as well. And it's important to keep, for people to keep that in mind. Yeah, you got to watch out for Ubisoft. Um, not that they're incapable and stuff, but they have a lot of teams in a lot of different languages and translations get back and forth. So this may not have been what they wanted to say, but it's what someone translated and posted for some reason. And it just got out of hand. You never know. You never really know. Yeah, and everybody treated this like a leak. But honestly, it could have just been an information for Ubisoft's approach to next gen and people interpreted it as a PlayStation 5 as a whole thing. So they're like, oh crap, we didn't mean to do that. And then they deleted it for that reason. Not because it was some unintended leak. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cause, yeah, because this is the only the only company that we're seeing this from. Now, if we got this and other companies hinting at the same thing, different conversation. But, you know, it is, it is kind of a single situation as of right now. Yeah, I'm going to interpret it as a miscommunication until told otherwise, pretty much. Yep. So I guess we could jump into one more story that it's not going to be a long story, but I think it's something worth mentioning because these guys were one of the biggest names pretty much at one point on the PlayStation 4 generation, unfortunately for them. Infamously, yeah. Yeah. So it seems like Hello Games is back with a new game. So No Man's Sky developer uh, Hello Games has a portion of its team working on a quote unquote huge ambitious new project that's very early in development. Mm -hmm. And there was an interview with Polygon. Studio founder Sean Murray explained that Hello Games is now made up of 26 people, and that's crazy that this team, that this name has been ringing through the industry 
for years now at this point is less than 30 people that's crazy yep. three have been working on a new hello game short the last campfire the other remaining 23 are split between working on updates for no man's sky and a brand new project that uh, sean murray is calling a huge ambitious game like no man's sky but it's it's not a sequel and he's not exactly sure how to talk about this game early because obviously no man's sky was hyped beyond belief obviously some of that fault goes on to sean murray but some of that fault also goes on to playstation which propped this game out damn near to feel like a first party release yeah. and so everybody in many ways kind of treated this game kind of like a new playstation game and when it came out it was very much an indie game it was an algorithm it was a generator it was this exploration game that was going to be filled out over time it was a games as a service half kind of experience also a tech demo but people treated this like this expansive universe skyrim open world type thing when it was not that and naturally obviously they got tremendous blowback and blowback onto a a game studio like naughty dog is tough imagine if you're less than 30 people how that feels Mm -hmm. where people didn't weren't even really talking about you that much to begin with beforehand from now it feels like the world hates you you're not your end public enemy number one that must have been brutal and uh i highly suggest you check out this interview because it's really interesting hearing from sean murray post that whole controversy and not to mention say what you want about no man's sky it's not my type of game they i really feel like screwed up the launch obviously but you got to give them credit they stuck by it and the game as it exists now is more than they initially promised. So not only did they deliver on everything that they said they were, eventually they delivered. They delivered on more. And now this has really turned out to be a really awesome experience that not only has multiplayer, not only has these random encounters like they showed off in that initial trailer and extraterrestrial thing and all these different exploration and different abilities and different planet sets and life is more varied than it ever was. They really delivered something quite remarkable for such a small team and so obviously there's immense talent at this studio that it was just it was a communication issue and it was a marketing issue ultimately it wasn't a talent issue is they communicated something that was going to take years to realize but they marketed it as if this is what you were going to get day one and that again is partly hello games's fault partly sony's fault so first off how do you feel about No Man's Sky in 2020? And also, is this a project that you're exper- uh, you know, interested in checking out considering the, the fact that Hello Games has been so rife with controversy? So, you know, I was excited. Actually, you were the first person to bring No, you know, no Man's Sky to my attention one time. And I pre-ordered it. I went and picked it up on launch day I think after I watched a lot of trailers and the interviews with, you know, uh, Murray and everything like that. And obviously, day one, I was like, nope, no, no, no. <laughs> um, it was, you know, not anything near what they promised, super boring, all that stuff like that. I maybe played it another time after that, and then it sat on my shelf for a long time. I may have even sold it, because I don't see it here behind me. Or I may have lent it to somebody, and they just took it. But uh, what a redemption story, you know, yeah. for them. Because, you know, they quickly started working on it hard. They could have abandoned this game and probably would have shot themselves in the foot. And Hello Games would be just infamous and red marked. You know, people would know that's, you know, the Scarlet A on them because they made a horrible game and then abandoned people who purchased it. So I got to commend them and huge props because, from my understanding, though, though they re released it, if you had the original one, you got all these updates for free. I could be wrong. There may be some pay ones, but from my understanding. All the major expansions were free. Yeah, the Beyond one, which was almost like a sequel. I, I did see someone play that one. It was almost, it, it looked like a sequel. Yeah, they and it was, a lot. And it was there for that. And I remember working at GameStop when this first, like, revamp came out. People were excited. People were like, you know, it was bad at launch, but it's super good now. And all these stuff. And Twitch streamers and all that really helped on it. And they just kept adding and adding. And they added, like, better multiplayer. And they added better, you know, mechanics and the surviving rate and the survival aspect. To the point that I even believe it has PSVR compatibility. Yeah, I, I believe so. I, I, so. You know, all still for free, which is... I've been wanting to go back to this game for a long time, um, especially once they hit me with that VR stuff. And I just haven't yet, you know. I put it in my cart constantly. I see it on a sale. I want to get it. But, you know, 
a big shout out to them for sticking by their vision, sticking by their fans. You earn a lot of points that way, which is why I'm way more excited for their sequel. You know, the last campfire is, is not well, not the sequel, sorry, but the next game. You know, the last campfire looks good, but now yeah, I want to see small thing, yeah, yeah, which is like a small, th- you know, their smaller game. But now, what does the new game look like? You know, I'm glad it's not a No Man's Sky sequel because you guys have been spending years, years on this, like on the same game. I, I've lived in like four different places <laughs> in the time frame that I remember living in my parents' basement when the game came out. I've been to two different apartments and gone back to my parents' basement, and now I'm in another apartment. In the time that you guys have been working and revamping this game, so people got their money's worth, and you did it. So you guys, I I assume, now I have to assume, because we never know, that their next game will not be releasing in such a uh, bad state. I'd rather them, them take their time, work on it, obviously, in advance. So that's, why I'm, that's why I'm glad they're very cautious on discussing it. They're not talking about how it's going to, you know, they're, they're not saying that it's going to surpass what they did with No Man's Sky. They want to keep expectations low because, you know, they don't even know yet. They know they cannot come out again like this. Because then no one's going to buy your game until four years after you release it. And that's a horrible strategy. And that's not going to be good for you. So I'm excited. They have my praise and they have my confidence. I'm confident they're going to release whatever it is. It'll be good. It'll be interesting. You know, be cautious. That You should be cautious with every developer and stuff like that in, in this day and age. But I think Hello Games knows that they could have shut down. No Man's Sky could have been the death of them. And they used it to really rise from the ashes. Yeah, and what interests me the most... No Man's Sky I was excited for when it came out. But the exploration and the sci-fi aesthetic and all those things is not Mm -hmm. what interested me in Hello Games and No Man's Sky specifically. It was always the tech. And the fact that this small team had this insane auto-generator universe maker algorithm. And again, I'm not a super tech guy, but I'm super fascinated by that. Because it, it's beyond the applications of what Hello Games was able to do with it. I'm just curious about what they do. Like, let's say if they use this engine or this generator or whatever you call it in, like, a city thing. Where they make, like, imagine, like, a cyberpunk-esque game. But instead of generating a universe randomly for you, they generate a city randomly for you. With random occupants, different species in this kind of futuristic world, different vehicles, different aesthetic. Maybe you're in a neo-noir city in one thing and then you go to another city and it's super cyberpunky and another one is, a, you know, a dystopian type look of it. How interesting would that be mm-hmm. if they, they take this generator and apply it in different ways? And again, I don't know how malleable this generator is and if it's built solely for planets. And I, I don't know how exactly that works. But I'm curious to see what on a technical level Hello Games does with their next game more so than what narrative choices they make and what aesthetic choices they make because again i don't know necessarily what they're fully capable of they're a relatively young studio they've done a couple games at this point that were very different from one another so i i think we still have a couple years ahead of us before we really know what the hello games motif and vibe is at this Mm -hmm. point Mm -hmm. Uh, again no man's sky was one thing that blew them uh, it catapulted their name into the cultural zeitgeist but they're capable of a lot of different things, I'm sure. And as the team expands and the talent pool expands, they're naturally going to go into different things. So I'm more excited to see where they go with the tech and to see if that leads into something that maybe works better off for them. So maybe they could be generating cities and, and, yeah. and different counties and stuff like that. That might work out better for them and, and have a better experience than maybe a randomized universe where that might feel a little bit too empty maybe if they try to apply it to something that's a little more densely packed it'll resonate better with people i i'm not exactly sure again everything is speculation but uh, i'm gonna keep my eyes out for them because i feel like in many ways they got an unfair shake where people were asking stuff of them that you would never ask of any other 30 person team but because they attached themselves unfortunately or they were attached to playstation and sony at large they were catapulted into demands that were normally isolated towards freaking, you know, Sony Santa Monica. And Mm -hmm. this is a small team that 
they're an indie dev that should be treated such. And that doesn't mean low expectations, but that necessarily means tempered expectations. Yep. And kind of take what they're offering you and, and hold them to that. Hold them only to their own standards, not to the standards set by a publisher or anything like that. So uh, I'm going to keep my eyes out for them. And I, I hope that No Man's Sky has repaired their image a little bit, showing people that they stuck by it. And yes, we know the... The intro was a little bit botched, but by the end, we delivered what we told you guys. And maybe starting from the ground up with a nice announcement. And again, the average consumer don't know who Hello Games is. They don't know who Sean Murray is. They know what No Man's Sky is. So Mm -hmm. if they launch a new game with a whole different title and a whole different vibe, a lot of people are not going to walk into it with all these negative feelings. Now, yeah, if they come out with No Man's Sky 2, you might be inheriting a little bit of nonsense. But if they, they announce a brand <laughs> yeah. new game that's not even sci-fi with maybe the same tech, but a whole different subject, a whole different you know goal in mind, I, I feel like they won't inherit as much as they might be afraid they are. You know what I mean? Like I feel like, yeah. obviously, Sean Murray has a lot of apprehension because one thing, you could tell he is not a PR guy. He was not this guy that meant to be selling a game he's not a salesman he's kind of just a game developer and he didn't communicate things the best because i don't feel like in many ways he's a communicator he's not a marketer and so i feel like he's very apprehensive that he's gonna walk his company back into a situation that i doubt's gonna happen again because i feel like that was kind of a perfect storm of nonsense that there were a uh, developer that were not ready for that fame that were thrust into limelight and in many ways justin bieber themselves where yeah. they were not ready for all that fame i mean they were on the cover of a game i have the game informer they were the cover they yeah, were the cover story of it's like they did not need all that clout that early yeah. into their life cycle so hopefully <laughs> this time I, I have a lot of pleasant feelings and hope for them because i think they could turn they could write this wrong and they could turn this ship around and their next project could ship and could be an amazing experience and can undo a lot of the nonsense that got attached to their name. Absolutely. So I guess we can jump into the first of our two loose topics. And mm-hmm. we really filled this show out. So that's really awesome that we just yeah. hit, uh, we, we passed an hour at this point. Which is, an, an, the first loose topic is going to be an existing non-game IP that we would like to see get a game. So basically this is an IP from movies, uh, comics, anime, whatever you want. And... Basically, pitch us on a game. What do you see the story being? What is the IP? What genre would you like it to be? And who would you like to develop it? And kind of pitch it like, this is what I'd like to see be made. So, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, because I think you have a... I mean, we. I don't know what your, yours is yet, but I feel like you have a big one to get into. So, you know, this was a difficult one for me, like I was saying earlier. Um, and it took me a long time for some reason. And I came up with some good ones. And I, can't, I I had one idea, and I was like, that's it. And then I kind of threw it away, which was uh, just a quick mention. I was thinking an Inception game by Remedy. and okay. just Oh, that makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. But then I was like, mm, it's too. it'll be too close to Control. It would be way too close to what Control is. It would almost end up being like a, you know, a, 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 a skin of it. But um, then I started thinking of... An existing universe in what we have in the video game realm and right now it's attached to sony so i'm thinking what would exist in like the marvel universe that sony's building right now with like spider-man and i started to think and one of my favorite heroes and i he's popular now because like thankfully had a netflix show was a daredevil game and i know we actually had a tiny rumor that was quickly squashed um i want to say almost a year ago and I just want a Daredevil game in a game where in a, in a world where we don't have the stealth games that we used to. We don't have Splinter Cells. We don't have anything like that. I think Daredevil would fit in perfectly. Again, you can tie it into Marvel, you know, Sony's Marvel's Spider-Man if you wanted to. Obviously, be, being placed in Hell's Kitchen in New York. I think there's even a small Easter egg in Spider-Man when you see uh, Murdoch's office building stuff like that. I just think that game would fit so well because it's not just another hero action you know it's not like the batman arkham games which have similarities to spider-man and gameplay wise like that but being able to do some of the slight detective works a lot of that you know sneaking and a lot of that stealth mechanic as daredevil or as you know matt murdoch i just feel like would fit perfectly in a, in a world that we don't have that because we don't have stealth games right now we have games that have some stealth mechanics in it and things like that 
and doesn't really work. Also, Marvel has such an abundance of characters and stories you can go with. Obviously, a lot of these lesser known ones can be brought over. Obviously, you have easy choices if you were like basing it off the Netflix show. You know, people love Punisher, people love Kingpin. You know, Kingpin's been used tons of times and stuff like that. He's also just <laughs> what a great villain Kingpin is um, because he's not just, he's all about himself. So I just feel like this is something that would be different, especially if you, if you know, if you want to place it in New York and being on the ground is, because usually when you get a game that's based in New York, it's always about running through New York really fast or swinging through New York really fast. I think having it on the ground, feet on the ground, obviously you have the parkour mechanics would be great, wall jumping, all those mechanics that Daredevil has, the combat, the combat would obviously be similar to all those other things as well, but I think it's something that would really, I mean, I know I would love it, and I feel like other people would love it too if they marketed it correctly with the stealth mechanics, a lot of the, you know, detective working as just Matt Murdock without the suit, and a lot of those discussions and the conversations and the characters development, I just feel like it'd be a perfect storm that it would just work so well. And it's something I've always said I wanted a good Daredevil game, and I don't think we've ever got one. I don't even. Maybe they did um, one off. Uh, I think based on the movie from the Ben Affleck movie. Oh yeah, that's right. There might have been one then, but like yeah, a PS2 yeah. game or something like that. Yeah, no, no, no thanks. <laughs> um, Man Without Fear too. I think there was a, a comic based one. Yeah, um, but yeah, man, I, I think that's just that's that's an IP that I really want it to be fleshed out in a game where you can take your time. You're not constricted by all these other things, and you're also such grounded. Like it's always been almost like you can be so less campy with Daredevil due to its villains and to his aspect to the you know drug world, the gang wars that's always taking place through New York. So that's that's my choice. That's the game I want to see. Yeah. So I was wondering some questions about yours. Yep. What aesthetic do you have in mind? Are, are you going more of a super dark, gritty Frank Miller? kind of aesthetic are you envisioning something closer to like some kind of stylized look like a arkham do you get more like the campy 90s version of mm -hmm. daredevil or are you envisioning like maybe uh, a more very grounded look like the show so i i got mixed feelings because i thought about this as well i'm like man what do i want and i could see it work out in two different aspects i can see a very dark you know gritty bloody sin city sort of style um, I think there is, I think it all really depends, you know, if you're going to go with the dark, the dark, let's say Nolan style, that's the best yep. way I guess I can bring it up. I think that's probably where you're going to hit it, because if you go to comic booky to, you know, super bright red suit, let's say for, for, for Daredevil, it just, I feel like you're going to lose people, that, that aspect, look like that that's one thing. One spider man look. Yeah, you know. Because that's one great thing about the Netflix show that found crazy good success in the three seasons run. You know, he didn't have, like, this super bright red suit. It was, you know, more maroon than anything. He didn't walk around with a giant, you know, DD on his chest. You know, obviously, I'm a huge fan of the yellow and red and the yellow and brown Daredevil Classic. suits. Yeah. yeah. But obviously, you would have to work it out a little bit differently. I think that's where I would be going. I do want it to be... It, initially, I would love it to be like an M-rated. I'm sure Marvel wouldn't allow it. M-rated, like super gritty, like game. That's that's where I would envision it because this is what Daredevil is to me. Is a brutal, you know, choice making game. And um, oh, for developer, I would have to choose Sucker Punch. Okay, yeah, that makes I a lot of sense. I think if, especially people who've played Ghost of Tsushima. And, you know, if the, the Ghost of Tsushima had such good stealth, if they really went into, you know, because they had a balanced stealth and it's normal combat and stuff like that. Imagine it when if, if, if it was like 75% stealth and the combat's still there and things like that. But I just think they're the, the ones up to the task. I'm sure there's other people who were there. But, uh, you know, Sucker Punch really just showed me they got the guns to make something even better. And, and not that Daredevil would be better than Ghost, but, like, they can really go all in one side and that's what i would love to see yeah so mine is interesting because it's similar mine also comes from a comic mm -hmm. but it would be stylistically way different from yours so for the name of the game that i have in mind i kind of couldn't settle on it's, it would have to be one of two things there's a title i want and then the title that they probably would have to use to make it marketable 
and this is something that had they've tried to adapt before but i felt like they've never quite gotten it right and i think it's because the medium was wrong they tried to make a movie about it and it didn't quite resonate right because i feel like this is best done as a video game because of the mixture between action and atmosphere that mm-hmm. only a game i feel like could get it right other than the comic so the name of the game that i want is hellblazer and wow yeah they would probably have to call it like constantine mm-hmm. but i would like it to be called hellblazer because I think that that's such an amazing name once you understand like what it's actually about. It's bigger than Constantine. Uh, it would be obviously a third-person action game. And so I kind of played around with developers. And I'm like, who can actually do insane atmosphere? Because again, Constantine is not this dude that is a great fighter. He does magic, but he's not. it's not like Harry Potter kind of magic. It's, it's going to be a lot of dialogue. It's going to be a lot of really unsettling, scary imagery. Who can do really scary imagery but action at the same time? Oh, Ninja Theory. Mm-hmm. No one's better at that right mm-hmm. now than Hellblade. Mm-hmm. Which is funny that they both have Hell in the title. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, it has to be Ninja Theory. Because no one can do... Imagine kind of like when you're playing as Senua. She has all these voices and ghosts around her and demons. And you're talking to these people. But when you go to fight, it's these massive enemies and dodging and stuff like that. I'm like, that's perfect for Hellblazer. And, and Constantine. So I want Ninja Theory to do it. And the synopsis would be basically... I want to do it based on the Dangerous Habits run. And I haven't okay. read a ton of Hellblazer. But that's basically his kind of origin story. And that's the same storyline that they try to adapt in the movie with Keanu Reeves back in the day. But that movie came off way more like like a Supernatural episode than actually <laughs> what the original like vibe of the comics was it's way grittier it's way darker he's dying of lung cancer and he's this really unsavory character that i felt like the animated movies did better than the actual live action version did but yeah john constantine's not a great dude so i'm like how do you kind of make a game where like you're rooting for him to get better but you have to acknowledge that he's kind of a piece of crap but it's okay because he's scamming satan you know what i mean so it's like <laughs> So it's like, yeah, the synopsis is him basically deceiving and conning the... Well, I, it's Satan, but they call him, like, First of the Fallen. And he ultimately gets cured and stuff like that. Not a spoiler. That's the literal storyline for it. So, yeah, that's kind of my view. And that the funny thing is, yeah, this would be an Xbox exclusive, you would imagine, because it's yeah. Ninja Theory at this point. And I'm like, how dope would that... Like, if you want to compete with Sony, that's the way you do it. Which is, you're going to out-serious third-person action them. And I think this is the way to do it is get Ninja Theory to work on a super, super dark, really scary, but action third-person game like this, where you use a guy that you're going to have a bit of survival horror to it because he's not a dude that has swords and all these crazy things. He uses his hands and his magic mostly. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a lot of running. It's going to be a lot of hiding. And then when you have to fight, you have to fight. But the bigger fights are going to definitely be on the latter half of the game. Because that's where he'll have all his abilities. So yeah, that was that was kind of my my vision for it. Man, I want, I want that game. Man. You see, I knew you would have liked it. I love Constantine. You know that whole era and stuff like that. And uh, would you get Matt Ryan to do his voice in there? Oh come on, <laughs> that man is choice. that man is Constantine to me now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, that sounds amazing. And you're you're absolutely right that. Ninja Theory is the one. Like as soon as you said that Ninja Theory, I thought I looked. I saw Sasuna's in my mind and just skinned it with Constantine. I just imagine him walking while hearing all these little demons and all these things like screaming at him and talking to him. Like, oh my god, I would lose my mind. I would absolutely lose my mind. Especially if you people, anyone who's just seen like Justice League Dark and those animated series of just a little bit of what they've done with um, John Constantine, that would be amazing. My goodness, I'd buy the collector's edition of that. Yeah, and also, I did have some things in mind. And yes, obviously, Matt Ryan, the first person I go to, if <laughs> if he's inaccessible, I did have somebody else in mind. The guy from The Boys who plays Billy the Butcher. Oh, absolutely. You know, I've always thought... Cause, uh, he's kind of constantine He's kind of constantine like, Not if you think about him in Thor Ragnarok, but... Um, yeah, very different there, but in, in but, The Boys, uh, he's... Oh, I can't. I think of his name correctly right now. Car Urban. Yeah. 
You know what? And I'm trying to think of. So I've been finished. The accent. Oh, the accent is there. Just the way he acts. Um, as Billy the Butcher. Oof, man. Yeah, that's the kind Ooh. of look I had. Like, if they had yeah. to like mocap it, maybe go for like him. That that's the kind of look. Like, except super disheveled because obviously he has freaking lung cancer on the first half. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, oh, yeah, yeah, whittle him up. But man, that that would make a lot of sense. The only thing is, yeah, if they do Hellblazer, obviously, a shared universe is probably not the direction to go because he. Yes, I know a lot of people are like, oh yeah, DC. Well, Vertigo, it, the Vertigo imprint got bought out. And I always felt like they've integrated Constantine and the Hellblazer line into something that probably... He's never jived well. Mm -hmm. And the only way they've been able to make him work was literally creating the Justice League Dark and taking all the magic people and putting them together. When he's always been kind of out of place. Kind of like Punisher in that way. Where he's always been kind of out of place. Amongst all these people with these crazy powers and stuff like that. And these guys literally just want to drink bourbon at a bar. That's all they want to do. They don't want no problems. So yeah, that that, that was my vision. And the moment I thought of it, I'm like, I, this game needs to be made. Yeah, I know, right? Oh my goodness, I'd be so excited. I, I don't know if I would... I don't know if I could contain myself. That'd be amazing. <laughs> so the second loose topic one is one that I know you're ecstatic to go over. We've been waiting to do this. Yes, yeah, so overdue. This is our favorite Sega console. Of course, I'm going to let you, Mr. Sega Man, go first. <laughs> so we all know I'm a huge uh, Sega fanboy, not just, just the Sonic IP, but most of that IP that Sega has, even though they're not doing much with it, which is a super annoying, except making dumb jokes on Twitter. Um, but yeah, my favorite Sega console, I, 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 it was an easy choice for me. It's something that even when we were going to do this topic uh, a few weeks ago, before we took our small break, Obviously, the Sega Genesis is just, I mean, where do I start? Like, it's it's always been, you know, growing up, it was always, to me, at least my group of people where I was raised and stuff like that, it was always, like, the more mature, cooler Nintendo. You know, even if you looked at the two systems shelf by shelf, you have this gray block, and then you have this sleek, awesome, you know, black system with a little volume knob on it. It just looked futuristic. But it's really the games that uh, that on the Genesis that spoke to me. And don't get me wrong, huge love for Sega and everything they did later on, obviously. But that Genesis is something I go back to. I mean, my Genesis is hooked up right now. I'm looking right at it. Yeah, same. Be- you know, everything about that. But even between, like, even between Sonic. Sonic being pretty much, you know, the answer to Mario. Always, to me, I always... At the time, I enjoyed those games more than Mario. I understand that's a different situation now. I... When you're little, you don't know, you know? You're thinking faster, cooler, that's the better game. Obviously, mechanically, Mario is superb. But I like the Sonic games for not having to be Mario. Obviously, you had all these other rocket, you know, what's the heck is that rocket game? There's a rocket uh, rocket armor or something like that, which is a armadillo or something like that in a suit of armor. Oh, which yeah, is way yeah, more the pl- mascot platformer era. Yeah, to make other rocket, knight, rocket Knight, I think it's yeah. called. You know, all these titles like that. But it's also, you know, thanks to the Sega Genesis is what introduced me into, you know, the fighting game community in the original Mortal Kombat trilogy. And let me get, let me tell you, when I saw that and when I saw, like, what the fatalities looked like on that compared to what they did on the SNES, it was night and day to me. I was like, why would I want that version when this is just superior in every aspect and all that, all things like that. It's just... You know, Sega. I remember getting my Sega Genesis. It was more of a hand-me-down, as always. Um, I'm the middle child, so while my brother got the SNES and the 64 later on, you know, we were always a little bit more behind. I got like, you know, I remember getting this big blue bin with a Genesis and then tons of games thrown in there. But let me tell you, those games I played on there will always hold a place in me because those games are the what made. I just was having so much fun with those. Like, yeah. Besides the Sonic ones, like. Everything I was playing there, you know, all these other games. Like, again, like I said, the Mortal Kombat. Right on here, I have, you know, Rage that I was playing. I got X-Men, like, all those, like, licensed games that I used to play on there. The Spider-Man ones and all those other ones where I was like, I'm seeing the things that I watch on my Saturday morning cartoons. I'm playing them to what I always said looked better than SNES games. Obviously, again, art style is a whole different thing. As a child, I didn't know. But it's, it's you know, just such a... It's such a good system. 
it's such a good system in a world where we were having these wars. You know, we had the Council War. You really had the SNES and the Genesis battling it out, obviously with the famous tagline, what is it, Genesis or Sega does what Nintendo don't. Yeah. Which I think is just amazing marketing. I think it's just the perfect way. And I also love that they, you know, the Sega Genesis came out and was starting to flop, and they knew they had to revamp it. They re-released it pretty much, you know, obviously, and giving out Sonic away for free. And they took that hit, and it worked for them. Sega, you know, in a, if I go back to then and think that Sega wouldn't be making consoles right now, it's such a weird concept to that. And yeah. I think it really spoke out with the Sega Genesis Mini that came out on the quality of their games and the history of their games. And you have a Sega Genesis Mini, actually, so you know that, I mean, those titles, I mean, I remember when you first opened it, and we just sat there looking at the titles, listening to the music, it's just amazing, and it's just such a flashback, and I do wish we lived in a world where we had Sega being way different than the Sega they are now, and obviously a lot of those people are gone, passed away, moved on, but... That will always be my favorite Sega console. And don't get me wrong, I understand, like, I have a lot of love for even the Game Gear, and I won't mention it because I know that's probably going to be your choice, <laughs> and I know it's your choice, so we all know which one I'm dancing around. But even now, I, I just love, love that Genesis. There's something about it. There's something about launching. There's something about holding that controller. I have the six-button control, but, you know, I also have the three-button, but just something about holding it and being like, man, I remember playing this. I remember, you know... It gave me that better experience. I remember playing, seeing my brother play Aladdin on the SNES, and I had Aladdin, and I'm like, oh, I got a sword in my Aladdin. Oh, and yeah. I thought it was the coolest thing, <laughs> even though it's ridiculous. And I forgot which one I have. I think I have Lion King on Genesis, but... Those platformers on the Genesis Those are Those platformers back here, yeah. Different, man. Yeah, I have Lion King. So I'm thinking of the... I think you have the Aladdin. But even playing Lion King on the Genesis, man... I just thought it was always like the better system. I also, I also got to give it to them. Just look at their 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 casing. Nice big black boxes, and detailing everything. Plastic and, man. Yeah, it ages you know, so much better. Yeah. The Super Nintendo boxes are annoying to get your hands on. Yeah, it's impossible because you know if the room was too moist. The box would get. <laughs> yeah, you you're know, done. if you're it was done. a hot, humid day, your your case was getting destroyed. But, yeah, so that's my system, Genesis. Me and Genesis are always, in, as soon as, you know, my Genesis broke actually a few months ago and I had to go get a new Genesis, which wasn't too hard. Luckily, there was a seller online. Yeah, they're relatively me, inexpensive. Yeah, it sold me the whole bundle pretty cheaply, so I was super excited for that. So that's me. I'm the Sega Genesis fanboy. I'm going to ask, even though I know the answer, what is your favorite Sega console? Yeah, well, I mean, okay, it, Sega's so tricky mm-hmm. because it's like, a lot of people act like they have two consoles when they don't they have multiple ones they just end they a lot of misfires some didn't come to the united states there's obviously what it's like the sg1000 or something like which is like their first yep. first one there's the master system which is their equivalent to the nes that i i couldn't choose the master system because there is absolutely some hits on there but it's they're they're few and far between it's not touching the nes then we have the Genesis, which is the obvious go-to. But I had to just look game to game. And to be honest, my favorite Sega games of all time are not on the Genesis. Which I know sounds like it's insane. But it's obviously, for me, the Dreamcast. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. And, and I do have to give a shout out to the Saturn, too. And obviously, there's great stuff on like the 32X and stuff like that. But those those are extensions. Those don't count. And this, the Saturn... Saturn is everything what's wrong with Sega to a T. Like, I, I don't know what was going on there. <laughs> they were going through it. But, uh, yeah, the Dreamcast. Now, before I get started, I wanted to compile a quick list just off the top of my head. So I, I was writing them down uh, right before we did the podcast. And I should have went on Google to check it out. But just off the top of my head, I wanted to think of some of the awesome Dreamcast games I like. Because a lot of people say the Dreamcast is great machine but doesn't have games. I'm just going to list off some of the games that I could think of off the top of my head. So there's Sonic Adventure 1 and 2. You had Skies of Arcadia, mm. Power Stone, Shenmue, Fantasy Star Online, Code Veronica, Soul Calibur, Marvel vs. Capcom 2, Crazy Taxi, Ikaruga, mm. Space Channel 5, Jet Set Radio, Sky- and, and did I say Skies of Arcadia already? Yeah. Okay, yeah. There you go. So I never want to hear nobody say that there's no Dreamcast games again. 
show me another console with a lineup like that. Come on, man. Come on. Like those those are those are real good games. So good that a lot of them got had to get ported to other games. So they're like, no, that you guys got to play this game. Exactly. So no, and and you have to keep in mind like when this console launched, like the power that this thing was outputting was like insanity. And to this day, like in terms of upscaling consoles, it does the best of any game game console from that generation. The way, the, okay, uh, like the way it was incorporating like memory cards and high resolution textures and a, um, a web browser and stuff like that. I mean, this is just a legendary console with some really awesome games. And I feel like the kind of downfall of the Genesis, uh, of the Dreamcast is less the Dreamcast fall and more so where Sega was as a company at that time. And unfortunately, it was one of, the, it, I, I feel like it suffered a little bit from like a Wii U problem where. It wasn't so much that there wasn't good games, but they made a lot of bad choices for what they needed to be able to do to compete at that time. Mm -hmm. And with the PS2 on the horizon and Microsoft jumping in and Nintendo obviously coming off the 64, which was a rough patch for them, but right there with the GameCube, they were in a point where they needed to come and they need to come hard and... It was almost like damn near impossible for them to ever be able to compete with these juggernauts in the way they were. Again, like at PlayStation were, I feel like Sega stumbled. And in their stumbling, they allowed PlayStation to just come right in and dominate and take their spot in many ways. So suddenly, people weren't talking about Sega versus Nintendo anymore. They were talking about Nintendo versus PlayStation. And that stumble, that's all it takes is a couple too many extensions for the Genesis and launching a disc-based console a little too fast that by the time the Dreamcast came, it, it was too late. There was nothing really they could do to make it work. And everything you'd want from a console, which is a strong a strong piece of hardware, good first-party games, and great third-party games, were all there, but the company itself were not in the financial position to be able to double mm -hmm. and triple down to make it work. So, basically, they had to give up and they had to start porting their stuff to Nintendo, their biggest competitor at one point, and kind of just get out of the console space and just be a publisher. So, again, a lot of the critiques that the Dreamcast get, again, I look at as more of a Sega problem and less of a Dreamcast problem. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if I had to choose a second one, obviously Dreamcast is where I would go. Yeah. Because, you know, I still remember them doing things, obviously prior ps2 coming out and xbox being what it ended up being i remember going to a friend's house and he was playing i don't remember specifically which one but he was playing a sports game online on his dreamcast and i'm like what do you mean and i remember him he's like oh but look at this and he launched the web browser and i'm That's like insane. i'm like you can go on the internet without having to sit in front of a computer and it was just such an it was so it was so trippy and i'm like this is the future even when you look at that that control now now you know it's not the best you know to hold but at the time when you saw that control it looked futuristic it looked something straight out of like a out of back to the future too where it was like what is this and it looked so cool and it was so amazing and i also am a big standby where people say oh i had no games that's a terrible lie because i mean dead or alive 2 was on there all these and the you whole list, my list yeah you, you heard, heard that list <laughs> Not even just the Sega ones and things like that. It yeah. had good games. You had RPGs. You had sports games that played better. You had Shoot everything. Em ups. Shoot 'em ups. Some of the best of all time, including Ikaruga. Yeah. So it's like it was there, and you're just you're. It's just the. It just wasn't in the cards for Sega to plan it right, release it right, and all that stuff, which did unfortunately cause its its downfall. And I know a lot of people throw around the term like ahead of its time a lot. But I think there's no better example than the Dreamcast, not only on a technical level of what the console is able to do and output, mm -hmm. but the fact that if you look at some of the franchises that were on this console, a lot of them persist online, which is are uh, uh, to this day. Yeah. Which is not something you could say for a lot of consoles of this generation. So like, I, and I know a lot of people have their jokes about Sonic Adventure, but the 3D Sonic games were that this is the, their first foray into what it ultimately turned out into. So all the awesome PS2 and PS3 ones that some people like, some people don't. This this laid the framework for that. Mm -hmm. 
not to mention Power Stone in terms of th- third person action games. I mean, with and I wouldn't I'm not going to go as far to say obviously like Power Stone led to Smash Brothers cuz Smash Brothers existed. I know that. But in terms of a lot of the quality of life changes that came out after the fact, I mean, I think we Power Stone did lend itself to a little bit of that in the in the melee world and then onto Brawl. Fantasy yeah, Star Online. Yep. You go on Xbox now. Now that's still a thing. Set up on Dreamcast. Code Veronica, one of the most in demand Resident Evil games to get re released or, or, you know, gone back to at some capacity for Capcom. Started on Dreamcast. Soul Calibur, still an active franchise to this day. Yep. Marvel vs. Capcom. Yeah, okay, the last one was a little botched, but I mean, that franchise? Come on now. But even then, yeah, MVC2 is still held up as like one of the best fighting games ever. I disagree with that, but yeah. it's up there. And obviously, Jet Set Ra- without Jet Set Radio, I don't care what nobody says, you do not get Splatoon. Period. Nope. So, again, in terms of influence, few consoles have ever had the influence that Dreamcast had. And it was like one of those... It's like one of those music artists that unfor- was like super dope in their time, passed away young, influenced a whole bunch of artists, and a lot of people did not give them credit when they were still alive. But in retrospect, we look back at them and it's like, man, they were really changing the game, weren't they? And that's yeah. kind of how I look at the Dreamcast. It's like Absolutely. the console that passed away too young, that influenced everybody, and in their day, everybody had jokes for them. But then fast forward, when you look at the industry and you saw how much that affected to this day, like I, I honestly could say, and I know this is gonna be a hot take, that in many ways the Dreamcast has a bigger influence into where the game industry is now than even the PS2 or GameCube, in my opinion. Yes, that's just absolutely I, influence. I, I, I'm I agree just talking with that. influence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can co-sign that absolutely. Again, people they launched because they stepped on the shoulders of the Dreamcast. Is yeah. how I like to see it. I mean the GameCube. I mean, so much of the GameCube's third-party opportunities came off of the failure of the Dreamcast. Yep, correct. That's absolutely just kind true. Of, just like in many ways, what allowed the Switch to be so successful was allowing not only awesome Switch games, but access to a whole bunch of great Wii U games. Those ports of the Dreamcast games going on to the GameCube... Uh, like, I mean, Sonic Heroes coming off the back of the Sonic Adventure ports, that's what allowed for that. Is yeah, for that 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 Sonic fan base to jump ship onto the the GameCube allowed for these amazing and some of my favorite GameCube games ever. And now, obviously, that Nintendo Sega heritage is they're built in one with another. It's it's very common now to see that that. But at the time, I mean, they allowed for that that GameCube launch to be as successful as it was because Sega was right there with them, feeding them a lot of Sega's best games. Yeah. So that man. Quite a show. We got a lot out of it, and I knew the two yeah. loose topics was going to be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. No, well, we hit hour thirty-seven. That's good. Yeah. So hopefully next week we have more stories for you guys. But hey, even if we don't, I'll be sure to think of two more loose topics so we can fill in time and have a lot to discuss for you guys. And uh, hopefully, I mean, I'm waiting any week now. We need to get this price point for these next gen consoles. It's ridiculous. We're we're at the point where it's like, I thought rolling in September. I'm like early September. We gotta know. I just can't. I just can't do this anymore, man. My I, bank accounts are so apprehensive. I don't know what it's gonna do to me. Yeah, I just it's getting to the point where it's like now it's just not even funny. <laughs> it's not like we don't have a price point for any of this stuff and or release date. It's just now it's now it's like now it's time to get off the pot. It's it's that's it. Someone pull the trigger because I'm done waiting. Well. To end off the show, you know what we do have a price point for? It's the Atari VCS. So this was Jabral and I am with... Steve, hope you guys enjoyed. And we'll see you guys next week. Take care.